happy to be talking to Professor Matthew Fry Jacobson about his recent book, One Grain of Sand, that was published by Bloomsbury Academic Press in 2019. Most immediately in advance of the release of the album on January 1st, 1963, what was Odetta doing? What was happening in the United States that perhaps shaped the production of One Grain of Sand in advance of its release on January 1st, 1963? Well, she, um, you know, she had been traveling through the the folk world um, almost for 10 years at that point, um, or just about 10 years at that point, um, and had been a fairly well-known national figure in those circles for the last five of those years. Um, this is a moment when to be a folk singer really was to be something. There was a whole circuit of of really important folk venues um, from the West Coast through uh, cities like Denver and Chicago uh, to um, the East Coast, especially New York, but also Philadelphia and Boston. And she was she was really one of the mainstays on that circuit in the in the late fifties. Um, it was in those years that she was um, not only honing her craft as a folk singer, but expanding her repertoire. She spent uh, she spent a good deal of time actually studying um, the you know the old um, Smithsonian Lomax recordings um, in the the libraries of the University of California um, when she was still living there. Um, she spent a lot of time really as a student of the music um, and. And recognizing the political import of the movement of the of the music, she um, she never fancied herself uh, a terribly important political figure, even if she totally felt that there was political import to what she was trying to do as a musician. So when she showed up um, at the March on Washington, for example, it was at the invitation of other people. There were other people who said, you got to be there. We have to have you there. We need Odetta's voice in, as part of this, as part of this. And she always answered that call. So, you know, that kind of thing had probably started happening a few years earlier. Um, so she was, she was already well known on the political circuits at that point, but, um, but much more well known just as, as, as a folk singer who had a really deep and rich kind of repertoire that, that reflected something important about the African American experience. Well, it's a beautifully structured book and you talk about the ways in which um, One Grade of Sand um, embodies um, Odetta's approach to the folk repertoire says something about how she worked with the archive of Black history and was also for her a vehicle of for radical expression, in your words. Can you say a little bit more about how you uh, organized the book uh, into sections and how you decided which songs on One Grain of Sand to look closely at? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I, I will say there are two pieces of it that were the germs or the kernels of the whole idea. Um, one was something I understood very well, and the other was something I felt I needed to understand but didn't quite. The thing I understood very well was the significance of that folk coffee house circuit that I just described to you. Um, as a as a political and social space, I just thought that this is um, these venues represented a really important crossroads in the culture where all kinds of people were coming together uh, in an era when the left really needed that. I mean, this is, I think one of the things that we often forget about the, the modern civil rights era is that, that the civil rights public that had existed before the war um, was just decimated by McCarthyism and by the kind of post, post-war, um, Cold War politics of anti-communism. Um, and so if, if there was going to be um, a revival of a, a real robust kind of civil rights politics, as we know there was, um, the first thing that was going to have to happen was a new um, civil rights public was going to have to be kind of found and forged and encouraged and nourished. And, um, you know, this is, this is in some ways, it's a story that's been told as the transition from the old left to the new left. It's a story that's been told in terms of the transition from the black church to secular spaces like college campuses. 
Um, all of that is, is important. But I think that these coffee houses in the late 50s and early 60s were a place where um, old left folk singers like Pete Seeger and the Weavers and new left figures like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan, um, old um, kind of blues um, figures in their publics like Huddy Ledbetter and the, the kind of Alan Lomax crowd. Um, new folk singers like Odetta herself, um, beat poets. Um, it was just a really protean space where all kinds of people came together. And you could see at some of these clubs, like the Gate of Horn in, in Chicago or the Hungry Eye in San Francisco, you might, you might hear Odetta singing field hollers one night and then, and then hear a kind of left comedian like Mort Saul the next night, and then hear um, a, a blacklisted folk singer like Will Gear the night after that. You know, you just didn't know kind of what you were going to see from night to night or week to week. And I think that the publics that cross through those spaces are, um, are really important to the story of, of the, early, um, the early civil rights, um, the, the post-war um, iteration of the civil rights freedom struggle. Um, so that was a piece that I knew I wanted to tell um, and the song that I chose to do that with was Cool Water, which was a kind of folk standard uh, initially sung as a cowboy song, made most famous probably by Roy Rogers, although he wasn't the first to do it. Um, but Odetta's version is, is just what she does musically with it is completely different. It was to serve a very different purpose. She sung it in a metaphorical register. It's a story about, it's quite literally about a cowboy and his horse dying of thirst in the desert. And she turns it into this kind of metaphorical, um, really powerful um, kind of um, allegory about, uh, about the cool water of freedom and being denied that. Um, so I used, you know, I, I used the occasion of that song and what she does generically and artistically with that song to think about the the political work that was being done in those coffee house spaces by the cultural work that singers like her were doing. Um, so that was that was kind of in place before I started writing. That was something I knew I wanted to do. The the piece that I knew I needed to deal with, but I didn't know what to do with it, was the um, the song uh, Midnight Special, which is probably the most famous song on the album. It's a song that, that um, it's been done so many times by so many different people. Um, it's in some ways the most familiar of all the songs that's on that, that's on that album. I was always a little bit confused by it. It's a, it's a song, um, the, the Midnight Special is a train, and uh, the refrain is Shine Your Light on Me. And I never could figure out it's it's this the lyrics are clearly it's about a prison house so you know there's that dimension it's a little bit hard to follow and i was never sure whether shine your light on me meant that the train was going to redeem the narrator of the song and and, and take him or her away or whether it was actually a suicide song and in researching the song which dates back to the late 19th century in various versions um, what I discovered is that you can find versions that emphasize one or the other of those things. Odetta herself actually really played with that. So her versions changed over the time. Um, so that in, in the 1957 version that she cut, it's very clearly the Song of Redemption. Whereas in the 1963 version that's on One Grain of Stand, she's actually She's emphasized different things. She's reordered the verses in such a way that it's clearly a song about death on the, on the tracks. Um, so that was just, that was a puzzle that I was trying to figure out, figuring out how to understand the song, but also placing it in the long kind of long-lived genre of the prison song, which is so important in the African-American tradition. And so, again, that was just, it was um, a, a, a piece of a pretty long stretch of African American history that could be meditated upon and told through the history of the song itself and its various um, variations over the years, and, and including Odetta's own variations on the theme. So those were the two pieces I started with, um, and then the two pieces I added. One is um, one is on um, the, spir the spiritual kind of strain of the music. Um, and the other is on uh, their two Southern songs. One is about the bow weevil 
and uh, the other is uh, about um, the old cotton plantation. Um, so taking kind of spiritual geographies and social geographies, um, and, and again, talking about those themes through songs on the album, that became the strategy for the album, was to try to think really deeply about history, but to do it through um, the, the kinds of questions and answers that were at hand in the music itself, you know, which is, for me, I mean, that's one of the things that was such a delight about working on this project. Um, there was a lot of freedom in terms of what I could do in, the, um, in this assignment. Um, but that intersection between political and social history on the one hand and um, artistry and cultural production and genre on the other, I mean, that's kind of where I live as a cultural historian. So it, it just felt like a really rich opportunity and, and her archive is, um, is really quite extraordinary for that kind of reflection.